know you like that. Welcome into the Saturday show, everybody. Hope you're doing well on this Saturday morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm Jake Hatch, joined by Christian Esparza on this morning's program. Hope you all are doing well on this Saturday morning, whatever you might be doing. It's a bit soggy out there here in uh, Salt Lake City and surrounding areas. I know, uh, Christian, you said that your house, you had more rain overnight. I woke up to, like, a deluge coming down in my house in Saratoga Springs. But, uh, yeah, rainy Saturday here in Utah. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it started north and moved south, but mm-hmm. I, th- I actually think it's supposed to rain like all day. Yeah. So it's the funny thing is it's Memorial Day weekend and like it's going to be soggy today, but it's supposed to be like beautiful on Monday. So, hey, you know, that's what's important. right? We'll, we'll make the trade off on that. No doubt. Uh, hope everybody's doing well out there once again, uh, whether you're uh, driving around doing the honey do list, you're just chilling at your house or. Getting a workout in, whatever it is. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, coming up later on in today's program, David James will uh, stop by, uh, talk a little bit about Real Salt Lake. Uh, obviously, he's going to be on the call tonight as Real Salt Lake is in Dallas uh, to take on FC Dallas. Uh, we'll chat with him about that. Uh, we'll talk a lot about the NBA playoffs, fit some college football and college basketball news and notes in there, and just have some fun along the way. So, Christian, first things first, how are you, sir? I probably should ask that right off the top. Doing great, man. It's been like looking back at the past week, like let's go back to last Saturday's RSL okay. game yeah. and then all the way up to last night's Timberwolves Mavericks game. Yeah. Like there have been a lot of fun sporting events this past week. So I've been really good. It's been busy and yeah, there's been a lot of thrilling moments and we're going to delve into the NBA here in a minute. You got a highlight of the week that stands out above all else. Dude, I keep thinking back to uh, Scotty's Strawberry Cobbler <laughs> last Saturday. That was some good stuff. Yeah. Uh, I believe he t- ended up taking third yeah, so, in the uh, Cobbler. Yeah, so we were out at the uh, BBQ Pit stop. They had the, it's, it's a it's a competition. And Scott Gerard, that was his, I didn't know this at the time. I think I, I might, I, maybe I did, and maybe I mentioned it. If I didn't, it was his first ever, like, official barbecue competition. So props to you, Scotty, for uh getting into it because that can be pretty intimidating to be like i'm going against people who've done this literally for years uh but he gave us some of his cobbler and i was telling him like dude that's got to win that's got to be in the mix he finished third in the cobbler i think he finished was it seventh or eighth in his uh wing uh entry and i don't remember what the rest of them were but hey props to you scotty because i wouldn't be that bold to be like you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go compete against real barbecue pros right everybody that knows scotty Right, knows that he has a passion for this kind of yes. stuff. But it's one thing to have a passion for it, but then to take that passion and actually go to like mm-hmm. a competitive scene or a competition, like you said, against people that have been doing like this is their life. Like props to Scotty and he killed it. And we're thankful that we got to try some of that stellar food that they had, man. They oh. they treated us well. <laughs> okay. Here's the thing. I have had a hankering for wings literally all week since then. And I went to Wingstop been Thursday night. Uh, we have Wingstop nearby my house. And I love me some Wingstop, but not the same. That if there was the one, um, what's the gentleman's name? I I, probably, I wanted to give him a shout out. The, you had the bacon wrapped one, right? Yes. Oh yeah. My oh, gosh. yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's all I can say. <laughs> Those wings were to die for. So anytime that, you know, they want to have another barbecue competition and invite us out to broadcast live. I'm there. Yeah, so nice of them to have it right outside. Yeah. I really Tell me where and when. <laughs> it's, it's It was crazy. All right. Highlight of my week, I, I went to the Bees game last night. Uh, first Bees game in the books of the season. I uh, took my son and daughter and uh, had a really good time. We, had, we saw an inside the park home run. And my son, he's still learning about like what different things in sports are. And he saw the guy obviously run around the entire place. He's like, Dad, he can do that? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he can. You're like, oh, yeah. If he can do it. It was pretty fun. So a big win for uh, the Bees. They beat the Albuquerque guys to hope 6-2, their third straight win. And uh, they're supposed to play tonight and tomorrow as well. So if you want to get out to the ballpark, it's a great time. Obviously, we'll uh, watch the weather on that tonight in particular. But all right, let's dive in. And Christian, you you mentioned it. Uh, last night, NBA playoffs, I was obviously I said, at the Bees game last night. But I got home, uh, pulled it up on my DVR because I was seeing a tweet kind of flying about about last night's NBA playoff game between the Minnesota Timberwolves or I guess the Western Conference final game between the Timberwolves and the Dallas Mavericks and I remember checking in the first half of that game I was just pulling up my phone just to see the score and Minnesota's up like 48-33 and I'm like okay so Minnesota they're, they're responding from game one and I, that's what I expected frankly but then Luka Doncic decides you know what's going to happen here we're doing this thing. And uh, there was the incident as uh, Rudy Gobert uh, 
was an intentional foul. Did you did you make much of that at the end of the first half? Like, and people were like, Rudiger is punching Doncic in the ribs. I can see where you come off on that, but I just don't, I don't know that Rudy was like intentionally like trying to swing and be like, "Hey, I'm going to nail you right well, here." And the- everything looks worse in slow motion, oh, right? Yeah. Like, and and that's what I think it's easy to paint that picture if you slow it down and you're like, "Oh my gosh, it's so clear that he's punching at Luca's stomach." But then, like, if you watch it in real speed, it's like. He just that's to, hard to see for it, me. It was an intentional foul, and it was a yeah. hard foul. Yeah, yeah, it was a hard foul. I mean, it did look like he was probably going for the ball. I mean, obviously, yeah. Rudy's got those long arms. It's <laughs> There's no question he can reach around and go for the ball or, or sure. like you said, an intentional foul. But to say that he's intentionally punching somebody in the stomach based on the slow motion replay, like that's – it's hard to base the truth, like I said, off yeah. of something slowed down. But the simple fact of the matter is uh, Luka got his revenge in the end. Uh, and I got to say, Rudy Gobert, there's there's a reason why he's a four-time defensive player of the year. He is the single best defensive player in the NBA currently. Like He is going to be a Hall of Famer. Ben Anderson says this all the time in the show you produce every day. Ben's like, Rudy's going to be a Hall of Famer, and there's no doubt about that. When you have four DPOY awards, you're on your way to the, to the Hall of Fame. But what Luka Doncic did on that game-winning shot, that's just incredible. Rudy, I didn't think played bad defense, but Luka cooked him and nails a three. Yeah, and I mean, you could hear like the broadcast was questioning why Rudy was even in on the final. Before the play even started, they're like, why is Rudy in? Like, we know that the switching is going to happen. And yeah, it ended up putting Rudy on Luka. But the thing is, like, like you said, Rudy's defense wasn't bad right there. That's Luca's signature move is that little step back three. Mm-hmm. Everybody knew it was coming, but nobody, like, when it comes down to it and Luca needs that shot, nobody can guard that, not even Rudy. So I, I think it's a little silly to blame Rudy and say, like, <laughs> oh, he got cooked. Like, yeah, everybody else would have got cooked, sure. even the four-time defensive player of the year. Well, it, it, see, and you're right. The, the, it, everybody knew the switch was coming, but Chris Finch, uh, head coach of the Minnesota Timberwolves, he's not dumb. Like in here, here's the deal. I think there's a element. And I saw this more from jazz fans that I follow on Twitter. Oh, great! Another Rudy getting cooked moment. Like who, who could have seen that? Foreseen this happening? Here's the deal. They knew what was going to happen here. And are you going to sacrifice potentially getting a rebound in that scenario with maybe a younger player on the, uh, not a younger player, a, a smaller player on the court to defend against that? You know what? You live with what you do, but. <sighs> I actually think that Rudy did as about as well as you mentioned as anybody could because Luca's ability to create space and that just that subtle it was like even a half step back and just launch that three. You're right, it's his signature move and it is near unguardable. And yet again, uh, Luka Doncic shows what he is capable of. And by the way, the whole uh, dream of Luka Doncic getting frustrated with the Dallas Mavericks and potentially being traded, and there's the thought that the Utah Jazz may go all in on that. Yeah, that's very quickly dying if it's not already DOA. Yeah, and <laughs> I was definitely on, on in all that camp. Like, Come on. Here's the thing. If you could get a guy of his caliber, he's 25 years old, he's one of the five best players in the world, and you have a chance to get him, absolutely, you, you, you mortgage the farm to get that. But the fact that Dallas has now broken through with him and Kyrie Irving, well, yeah, that, that dream is, is, is dead. I do have this funny clip to play. This was Luca okay. on Inside the oh, NBA. Yes, in I was going to. Okay, yeah. go ahead. So play they're, they're they're asking about you know Rudy guarding him at the yeah. end. So this is what Luca had to say about that. Uh, you know, there's a lot of defensive player of the year on you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's long enough. Uh, he can move. Uh, I can move fast, but I can move faster than him. Uh, <laughs> well, it's true. He didn't move it's faster true. than him on that. Yeah, it's true. And it it's weird to see kind of the feeling that these players have towards Rudy because yeah. you could see even like the smirk on his face when Shaq said, hey, they put the defensive player of the year on you. And then, yeah, he gives that little smirk and it's like, I don't know why everybody kind of disrespects Rudy. Like there was that poll that came out who's the most overrated player in the NBA and it's Rudy Gobert, like voted by the players. Yeah. So uh, Rudy just doesn't get this respect from the players, but it's – I mean, Luca does have a point. Like, he's not known for his speed or his quickness, but at the end of the day, he can move faster than Rudy Gobert. He, yeah, no doubt about that. The other thing about this is, and I'm going to echo something that Ben has also said on here as a show because I, he and I have talked about, it and we agree on this. Rudy is a bit of a loner in, in the NBA. He, he, he doesn't, he doesn't pal around with a bunch of other guys in the NBA. He didn't come up through the AAU circuit. A lot of these guys 
that play in the NBA, they're the best of their generation, but they all kind of played in the same league or leagues that played against each other all growing up. Rudy Gobert grew up in France, uh, a guy that has he's faced all kinds of situations. He has uh, family issues on on one side and all kinds of stuff. So he kind of does his own thing. And I think that turns off some some NBA players of his generation. They're like, okay, yeah, this guy, whatever. And the Draymond Green thing, okay, that's that's a whole nother element to this because I don't know if you saw after the game the Draymond sucks thing, like uh, they're broadcasting. I was yeah, yeah. dying laughing at that, by the way. Is it's just Rudy is who he is, but he's very he's quite confident in what he in what he's capable of doing. And Luca's right. Luca was just faster in that moment, got his signature shot off, and create yet another one of those highlight reel moments that's going to live on forever. Yeah, and I just I lost my train of thought, but <laughs> <It's> okay, <laughs> like. The NBA is very clicky, is what I was going to say. Well, okay, we have the Banana Boat crew, LeBron James, Chris Paul, um, uh, Dwayne Wade, and uh, the, 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 yeah, they have their groups of people that they pal yeah, around with. Right, and if you're not in one of those groups, if you're not in one of those, you know, cliques, yeah. they're against you, and that's what we see with Rudy. Yeah, so really fun two games so far, but alas, Dallas is up 2-0 now in that series, and it's a bit crazy to consider because the way that <clears throat> Minnesota looked coming out of that Denver series is like, okay, Dallas, watch out. You're running into a buzzsaw here. And it's not that Minnesota has played bad by any means. We're just seeing Dallas, they're come up uh, and they're kind of they're shining in the moment here with Luka and, and Kyrie Irving in particular leading the way. The other thing about this with uh, Dallas is they are finding contributions from other players on the roster. Derek Lively. What an incredible find via the NBA draft he has turned out to be. I remember there were questions about him uh, when he was taken by Dallas. How is he going to fit here? Why are they doing picking that guy? Like, there were so many questions about it, and he's proved his worth. So we have been entertained, I think, highly by a series that's 2-0 right now. And whereas we'll get to the Celtics and the Pacers tournament, where that one feels like it's all but over and it's at 2-0. It's a kind of an interesting uh, – dichotomy here if you look at these two series Christian both of them are 2-0 series in these conference finals one feels like it's over the other one's like hey this thing could go to the distance even though one team is down 2-0 well and partially it's because we saw the last series Minnesota was up 2-0 correct yes Denver won three games in a row don't lose Mike Conley let's just put it that way yeah Yeah. right so (laughs) it's it's very interesting and um another thing I want to get back to is Luka Doncic he did not score the entire fourth quarter until that final shot. That was those were his only points. He'd of the, been taken the out of the game. Quarter. Yeah, and a conversation that I had with Jake yesterday on mm-hmm. the Jake and Ben show was, you know, because he mentioned that the the Mavericks are kind of this bandwagon that everybody's like, oh my gosh, they're good all of a sudden. <laughs> and I think part of the reason is, like you mentioned, Derek Lively and these other players. Well, Daniel Gaffer and Daniel PJ Gafford, Washington, PJ Washington, yeah. even uh, Hardy hit a couple big shots. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But I want to go to Kyrie Irving, man. Like this, it's almost like a resurgence to his career, right? Because mm-hmm. in Boston, he kind of flamed out, and the Nets, they never hit the ceiling that that everybody kind of put on them. And then he had all this controversy off the court, and it seems like ever since Kyrie Irving has been in Dallas. He's been quiet, and he's been focusing on basketball. And last year they didn't really do much, but it seems like now in these playoffs, Kyrie Irving is looking like the Kyrie Irving that everybody got used to when he's on the Cleveland Cavaliers. And he is so, so much fun to watch when he is in his zone. Well, the thing about Kyrie is he is one of the single best individual players. Like if you one-on-one, Kyrie Irving's going to beat a lot of people. The question has kind of always been about Kyrie. Can he fit within the framework of a team? Can he help exactly. them? Can he help elevate them? You're right. He's gone to Dallas and he had some early missteps and still was open in his mouth about stuff. But the last year, roughly, I, I, it's relative. He's you mentioned he's kind of just gone about his business. Like, I'm playing ball. That's what I'm going to do here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, like I mentioned, Luca was taken out of the game. Yeah. Who steps up and, and carries the team? Then it's Kyrie. And so this is what I was talking about with Jake Scott. Like, the Mavericks are so – it's so hard to beat a team when you have – obviously, Luka's going to give you f- basically a triple-double With, every night. He had 32, right? 10, and 13 last night. Yeah. It was a triple-double. So yeah. he's going to give you 30 points a night. Yeah. But obviously, there are stretches in the game where he's going to be a non-factor. Mm-hmm. So when you have somebody like Kyrie Irving who can play at that superstar level Bingo. when Luka's not doing his thing, then it's like, yeah, who can beat these guys? And then Stan Van Gundy – 
he threw out the question uh, uh, in game one and then he threw it out again last night like are Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic the best backcourt duo in NBA history and I think that's a bit of a stretch but it is an interesting conversation I think it's probably a prisoner of the moment kind of thing I don't know if there's a, that good. there's a certain tandem that has won six championships that I would consider the greatest tandem in the backcourt in NBA history. right you could go to Jordan <laughs> and Pippen yes you can go to Steph and Clay yeah I, I think both of those duos are are higher yes. but I think that and it's, it's especially weird to give that title to Luka and Kyrie without a championship yet maybe bingo yeah. but watching these games it's like the question isn't that far-fetched when you watch what happens, like like in game one and game two, sure. And you're right. When Luka Doncic go, comes, gets essentially just kind of bogged down in a game, you need somebody else to step up and have a superstar of Kyrie Irving's caliber to do that. He had a pretty pedestrian night by his standards: twenty uh, points, six assists, four rebounds. Nothing really to write home about. Seven of sixteen from the field. More importantly, four of seven from three. Like he stepped up in a big moment and helped them helped elevate uh, this Mavericks team, which. They're, they're playing really, really good basketball. And I, I don't want to discount what Minnesota's doing either because Minnesota's doing their thing. And the thing about Minnesota is Anthony Edwards, he's not shooting it well right now. If he gets back, if Anthony Edwards get back to, back to, gets back to doing what he was doing kind of in that uh, f- game four, five, six uh, territory of that uh, series against, uh, the, um, against Denver, this is going to be a series that can make, make a really – really long run here and we'll see what happens but i'm i'm highly entertained by what's going on here and it's two teams high level play it just so happens that dallas has been able to pull it out the last two games in a row yeah dallas was down i believe 18 or 20 um some that effect yeah at the the lowest and then you look you know everybody brings up the law of averages like eventually anthony edwards is going to get back to his normal shooting stats Mm -hmm. and then if dallas is playing out of their minds maybe they're going to come down a little bit but these next two games are going to be in dallas so does that play a factor does it not play a factor i mean dallas just won two games on the road uh, the previous Timberwolves Nuggets series home court advantage did not matter it went at out all the window, yeah. in that series. So at this point, it's like it doesn't even matter if it's back in Dallas. But you're right. Like if Anthony Edwards, he kind of took the the sports world by storm during that Nuggets series because he looked like an emerging superstar, um, and he's been keeping it up on defense. He's a really really good defensive player, but offensively he has fallen off a bit. So if he can if he can get back up to where he's not a liability on offense then yeah i mean the the timberwolves definitely are going to come roaring back yeah uh i did want to also spend a moment just on the boston indiana series now the situation essentially comes down to this is tyrese halliburton capable of playing and with a hamstring injury whoo I have my questions. I know that Adrian Wojnarowski, I, I think that uh, he said that it's it's very it's like questionable about if he's going to be able to play tonight if Tyrese Halliburton does not play, sorry, Indiana, thanks for coming, but it's Boston going to the NBA Finals. And it could be a sweep. It just, it's setting up that way. And that's disappointing because Indiana had been a team that had kind of shown a lot of grit. The fact that they uh, did what they did against the New York Knicks, which, by the way, the New York Knicks were like literally duct tape and bubble gum together because all the injuries that they were dealing with. But then Indiana made a nice run. But it looks like yet again, as of right now, at 10.20 on a Saturday morning here, we got Game 3 coming up tonight uh, between the Celtics and the Pacers. If Tyrese Halliburton isn't playing, this series could be over, let's see, they play tonight, and they could be over by Monday night, if, if I think is what the schedule is. Well, even if he does play, it's a stretch, right? Well, like, we saw sure. Game 1, that was their best chance at winning and, and starting fum- off the series literally on literally fumbled right. it yeah. away, and Tyrese and, was a big part and of Ty- it. Yeah, Tyrese Halliburton right there at the end of the game, uh, loses the ball and f- so you're right with with no Tyrese Halliburton it's almost unquestionable that the Celtics are going to win even mm-hmm. if Tyrese Halliburton played and you know if he plays he's not going to be at full health so it's like even if he does play I, I really don't see the Pacers making any noise in that series at all maybe they win a game and that's a big big maybe but you're right it's looking like it could be a sweep yeah, we'll see. It's kind of just an interesting deal as you look at it, saying, okay, where about uh, does Indiana generate anything from? Uh, great question for me because Indiana is a team that has got a lot of good players, 
but they're playing against two generational type players in Jalen Brown and, and Jason Tatum, not to mention Drew Holiday. And oh, by the way, Boston has this guy named Kristaps Porzingis who hasn't played. He's been dealing with a, a soleus injury. It's a calf muscle. Once he's back on the court, that makes them that much more dangerous. This Boston team, I know that they're getting a rep that they've kind of skated their way through a playoffs that has not really challenged them, and it may come ultimately their final first challenge in the in the finals. If everything plays out this way, but you know what, you do what you got to do to get to the finals and see what happens. I'm just interested, to, like you mentioned, to see if Indiana can find an answer to find anything really at this point. Yeah. And- Pascal Siakam, he's a nice piece, right? Yes, but he's not a number one. And no. He's, he's not the type of player that can single-handedly win you a series. And so without Halliburton, like, you're right. Like, so, who who do they have? Yeah, so it's the whole thing. Of, okay, you got Tyrese Halliburton and Jason Tatum are the unquestioned number ones on their team. Your number two's on your team. You give me the choice between Pascal Siakam and Jalen Brown. Guess who I'm taking every day and three times on Sunday? Jalen Brown. Jalen Brown. And some people would even take Jalen Brown over Jason Tatum. Sure, and tell me, yeah, that's the thing about this. The number two on Boston, you may take Jalen Brown over Tyrese Halliburton. Halliburton. Yeah, no so question. That that's kind of the situation you're looking at here. Is okay. What do you value? What do you want? And the way the Boston's built themselves, good on you. And there were a lot of people doubting them because they had really kind of just steamrolled their way through the regular season. And a lot of people coming into the playoffs, like, okay, Boston's not really been. Te- we'll see what happens here. They lose Kristaps Porzingis, and it hasn't really slowed them down all that much. Yeah. Al Horford looks like the Al Horford of, like, 20 years ago. And he's been playing for I don't know how long. He, he seemed like this veteran player for two decades now. Yeah. And so it is hard because you look at Boston's road mm-hmm. thus far in the playoffs. Round one, they face the Heat without Jimmy Butler. Yeah. Round two, they play the Cavaliers. Donovan Mitchell gets hurt. Jared Allen doesn't play. And then round three, Tyrese Halliburton doesn't play. So I think it is fair to bring up, like, yeah, the Celtics have kind of had a cakewalk so far in the playoffs. But like you mentioned, all they can do is go out and play the teams in front of them, right? They they have no control over who gets injured when they play. We know that the Celtics have a very high ceiling, and yeah. maybe it will hurt them in the finals if, if they haven't been tested so far, if they haven't had the face – adversity in the playoffs or maybe it's going to be the opposite maybe maybe they get a sit Kristaps Porzingis this whole series maybe so and maybe even Jason Tatum because he's had something bugging him too so maybe by then they'll come to the finals like fully healthy without having to face much of a challenge and that's going to play to their advantage it, it would I, I agree with you on that we'll see how they obviously approach this but uh we'll flip over coming up next i want to talk a little bit about what's going on in the college football universe locally and uh, some of the other sport storylines as we look forward uh the funny thing about this is we're going to have opportunities in coming years to watch potentially both the nhl and the nba playoffs playing simultaneously we've got that going on in dallas right now uh, with the dallas stars also in the dallas mavericks something that i look forward to I'd love to be able to think about having both the Stanley Cup and the NBA playoffs ongoing at the same time. I know the staff over at the Delta Center is like, please no, because yeah. <laughs> the changeover obviously is a bit of a, a bit of a bugger. But right, that's what you signed I up just, for. I just, I mean, like watching that game last night, I yeah. was thinking to myself, like, oh my gosh, I miss having Jazz playoff basketball. We all do. I all miss do. it so much. Yeah, and it's there's nothing like it, honestly, because the weather's really good this time of year. We have our broadcast as a station. We've done those out on the plaza for many of those playoff series, and there's, there's really nothing like it. It's it's an incredible feeling. All right, so coming up next, we'll flip over, uh, talk a little bit more about what's going on locally. Uh, also coming up later on in today's show, uh, David James uh, will join the program. We'll talk a little bit about what Real Salt Lake is doing as they are on the road tonight in Frisco, Texas, to take on FC Dallas. Uh, more in a moment. This is the Saturday show right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Jake Hatch here, Christian Esparza there. We got a theme for music today, Christian, or are we just rolling with whatever you feel like today? Whatever, whatever sounds good to the ear, man. Okay, fair enough. I just, I know Sarah recently uh, left the station. She was very much all on theming things, so I just was going to ask before we got too deep into it. I didn't pick up on it. Sometimes, I sometimes I'll theme it, but sure. sometimes theming it can get pretty hard. It can get monotonous at times, yeah. So I, I like to 
keep a variety of things. That way, everybody is happy. Hey, smart. I I can respect that. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the local local uh, college scene in particular. Now, Christian, uh, you are a proud graduate of Southern Utah University. Yes, sir. As you go, my T-Birds. go Thunderbirds. Uh, but uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on with BYU and Utah right now, and both football and basketball. Now, there was an interesting piece uh, written in the Salt Lake Tribune this week by Kevin Reynolds, and I want to get your thought on this. And he, he wrote about uh, Ephraim Asiata. Now, uh, most people know Matt Asiata, the standout running back from the University of Utah, went on to have a pretty solid career in the NFL. His son Ephraim has overcome a, a number of things, including a, a shooting uh, that uh, very easily could have taken his life during his high school days. Uh, he has turned into quite the athlete. Recently signed with BYU in last December and then went through spring camp with the Cougars, now uh, getting ready for his first season at BYU. And there was a lot of thought throughout his entire prep career that it was inevitable he was going to end up at Utah. Now, Kevin Reynolds uh, said that when he went to the commitment ceremony for Ephraim Asiata, Ephraim brought up the topic that he wasn't sure that that Kyle Whittingham was going to be at Utah for the entirety of what could be his run at Utah, three, four, five years, whatever it ends up being. Because Kyle, in his own words, said that if I'm still coaching at 65, uh, I, I don't think I'll be there. And Kyle's about to turn 65, speaking of Kyle Whittingham. There, and it's a very valid topic that Kevin came up with here, and I'll get your thought on this, Christian, is Ephraim Asiata said that the fact that there was questions about what Kyle Whittingham's future at Utah is going to be led him to say, you know what, I'm going to spurn my opportunity at Utah and go to BYU because the coaches at BYU look, look like they're going to be there for more of the long haul versus what's going on at Utah. He didn't want to maybe go through a coaching transition. The question I've got for you is, is the undetermined status of Kyle Whittingham going to be a detriment for Utah however long this goes on for until he either decides to put out a statement of, this is what I'm doing for however long, or you're, you're going to let it ride until he decides, hey, I'm done, I'm hanging it up? 100%. I think it's a valid concern. Um, we've seen it not affect them. For example, Isaac Wilson chose Utah over BYU yes, where his did. brother went and Mitch all three Harper, of all three of his brothers right so multiple brothers uh, Mitch Harper BYU insider mm-hmm. just released you know his top 25 of the 100 greatest BYU football players mm-hmm. of all time I can't remember exactly where I had Zach Wilson ranked but it was top 20 it was yeah. like 19 or something I think so obviously Zach Wilson has that legacy at BYU Isaac went to Utah but like you said that is it's a it's a valid point. Like if I were a recruit coming out of high school, I I want to go somewhere where I know is stable. Well, and the, the people you're committing to are gonna be there as well. Right. And so everybody kind of has their assumptions about the replacement plan for Kyle Whittingham. Like is it gonna be <laughs> is it gonna be Morgan Scally? Like how much is really gonna change um, sure. when when Kyle Whittingham decides to hang it up? But ultimately like that is an unknown. Nobody really knows for sure is going to happen. Maybe Kyle Whittingham himself knows. Maybe he doesn't even know. Um, and it, it, it's hard to say because you look at what's going on with the Utah program right now, the state of their roster. Sure. They've got Cam Rising. They've got Brant Keithy. They've got all these players, and this is kind of their last dance. Well, and – They've got an opportunity here. Okay, now they're making a debut in the Big 12 this year. Now that's obviously going to come with its own unknowns because it's a new conference and you never are quite 100% sure how things are going to go. But as you mentioned, the pieces that they have at Utah, yeah, a last dance whole thought is kind of what this is setting up for. Cam Rising in his seventh year. Brant Keithy's out of eligibility after this year. There's a number of players who have spent a long time working together at the University of Utah. And could Kyle Whittingham say, okay, this is the quote-unquote last dance. We'll see how we do here in the Big 12. I will be stunned, frankly, uh, come July 9th. It's 9th and 10th when Big 12 Media Days takes place down there in Las Vegas. I'm assuming that media poll will come out on the 9th. I will be stunned if Utah is not – if they're not the preseason favorite to win the Big 12, if they're not number two, something has gone completely off the rails. Yeah, they're certainly right there in the conversation, and they have everything in place to make a run at the Big 12 title. So if if that's something that happens and, and Kyle Whittingham has the chance to go out on top, I 
fully believe you will. And, and I don't really, I don't know him. Like I've never really <laughs> talked to him. Yeah. But like that just seems like the perfect ending to his career as the coach at Utah. And you know he's slowly been ab- adapting to this NIL stuff. And did you see his TikTok debut yeah, yesterday? Yeah, the TikTok was hilarious. Don't get this out of my face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. He has been doing what he can to adapt, yeah. but ultimately we know that this isn't something that old school style coaches like to deal with. So if if he can go out on top, I think that that uh, that makes perfect sense in my mind. Like the Peyton Manning, John Elway type ending, sure. go out with the championship. So and that so that brings up a very. Uh, interesting topic in and of itself is Kyle Whittingham looking at this it's like he wants to go and make a splash in the Big 12 I think he wants to check one thing off his resume before he's done he wants to compete and play for it all and that means making the college football playoff Utah has been on the doorstep a number of times over the past few three to four seasons just has not realized that now an expanded playoff field is coming into effect this fall that obviously opens up the opportunity and the avenue for Utah to check that off of his uh, career bucket list, as it were, and maybe, as you said, let him ride off into the sunset. But uh, to extend out what Kevin was writing about in the Tribune, he talked about Akina Lafono Hema from Springville. Essentially, it came down to reportedly BYU in Utah. He opted for BYU. Falatau Satuwala from Bountiful High School was considered for years, and trust me, I know this guy. I talked to enough people in the prep ranks that they're like, if he doesn't go to Utah, it'll be a stunner. What does he do? He spurns Utah and signs with BYU. Jay Hill prevailed and won out in the end. I'm just wondering that if uh, Kyle Whittingham, yes, it looks like Utah is set up to make a run this season at Utah. Maybe it is to their detriment in the short run recruiting-wise that BYU is able to scoop up some of this talent. The question I have, kind of what you're talking about, is, okay, does that mean that going forward – that it's going to be BYU is going to start winning more recruiting battles because of this, or is it essentially a blip on the screen here? And whoever it might be, I assume it's going to be Morgan Scally taking over. I think that continuity would be very smart on Utah's end. But is, does it mean that it's going to essentially be maybe a little bit of a blip here, and then Utah gets back to doing what they're doing? That's the question I've got. Yeah, and it's hard because the longer this drags on, like if this is a trend that continues— like, let's say theoretically, maybe Utah doesn't win the Big 12 championship. Maybe they don't make it to the playoff, but they still finish high enough to beg yeah. the question, can we do it next year? So then let's say Whittingham comes back, and then it's like, okay, the future is still uncertain beyond that. So the longer that this goes on without Whittingham having like a – and he's not, he's never going to come out and say, okay, guys, this is my last year. <laughs> okay, guys, I'm feeling two or three more years left in me. But I, I do think that the longer this goes on, it's going to be detrimental to Utah because it, it just it doesn't make sense to to want to commit to that uncertainty. Well, and that that that's the thing about it is, it, and BYU is not the only program who's going to use this against Utah. Every other team that's recruiting head to head against the Utes, you can guarantee whoever goes into that house of ex uh, in, insert name of prospect here and saying, hey. Come play for us. You don't know if if, if Wit's going to be there long term. Like that that is absolutely conversations happening today, and it will continue to happen for however long Kyle decides to go on. You made a very good point earlier, and I, I don't know if you meant to say this, but he said you said the state of the program for Utah right now. Kyle Whittingham has set this thing up that it's it's a well run operation, and it's just it's a kind of well oiled machine, kind of does its thing. Yes, he is uh, looking like it's, this is going to come to the end of another cycle of a, an elite crew of, of athletes led by Cam Rising and Brant Keithy, as well as a number of other players on this year's roster. And yes, in theory, that would be a nice time to essentially say, OK, I, I've had my quote unquote last dance. I've made the final run I'm going to make. Let's hand it over to somebody else and see if they can carry on the baton. But at the same time, when you're Kyle Whittingham, you've kind of built what you've built. Why would you want to step away right now? Yeah, and that's the other point that – the other side of the coin, yeah. I guess, because this is what Whittingham does. This is what he loves to do. Mm-hmm. So if he can make this work, maybe he's like, oh, yeah, I actually kind of like this uh, and the transfer portal and, and dealing with kind of these little half rebuilds and filling holes where I can and then also using homegrown talent. Like maybe he does actually like that. So – there is definitely, like, I don't want to act like it's a certain thing that Whittingham only has 
one or two years left. Like maybe sure. he does decide to keep on doing this. And if if he can make it work beyond this year's crew, like say they're successful next season, then maybe that does start to signal to these local players like, hey, guys, this Utah program, like they're in it and they're they're in it. And you should want to be a part of it as well. Well, and sure, and that's that's a big part of it is in the conversation is if BYU can continue to make gains in the recruiting sphere, that's only going to make this rivalry, which is already red hot, even without these two having been in a conference together for a decade and a half, they're back together. If they can start making more gains in the recruiting sphere and keep up what they're doing in terms of picking off some of these elite talents in the state and winning some head-to-head battles with the Utes, that's only going to make this rivalry that much more competitive on the field. We've been... The funny thing about this, we think about this, is it's been quite a while since we've seen BYU and Utah play. It was just the schedules just didn't pan out. Well, guess what? They're back together. And yes, I want to see it on Thanksgiving weekend. Wherever this game is played, the nice part is it's back together. And it's going to be more of an annual litmus test for both of these programs. Is Kalani Satake, is he finally figuring it out? Is he able to kind of make those inroads with Jay Hill and the rest of the crew at BYU in making gains in recruiting? Can it become more of a 50 50 rivalry? Whereas we almost had a 10 uh, game streak straight for Utah winning in the rivalry before BYU snapped in the most recent game they played. I would like to see it be more competitive on the field. And if it, if, if this trend holds, because it is a one-year thing right now, but if this trend holds, that indicates to me it may become more of a balanced rivalry. Yeah, and another thing that we haven't brought up yet, and maybe we're overthinking it, like, obviously, I, I so I haven't looked at some of these recruits that are committed to BYU. I don't know how many of them are planning on playing this season or if they're planning on serving missions or something so like that. Ephraim, already, Ephraim Asiata's already enrolled. He was actually uh, one of the standouts in spring before being shut down due to a minor injury. Uh, uh, Fala Tosatuala is going to enroll. He's at either enrolling right now or he'll be enrolling this summer to play. Uh, Kinelau Fonohem. Those are the three that, I, if I recall about uh, Kevin's story, they're the three local guys that essentially the, the recruiting battles came down to. Fonohem is going on a mission. So two of them are going to be on the field in theory for BYU this fall, whereas one's going to be a couple years out. So maybe that's what this all comes down to. Maybe at the end of the day it's just a simple conversation of, okay, am I going to be able to get time as a true freshman at Utah? Probably not. Yeah, I'm going to be able to get time as a true freshman at BYU, and that's what it comes down to. So maybe maybe that could be it. And so you're right. It's going to take a little bit, another year or two, to see if this trend continues. Sure. And then I I guess we'll have our answer. But there are, there are a whole litany of things that could be the cause of this. Well, and that that is the other thing about this is in the story also, uh, Jerome Miles, who actually just recently got a fifth star. He's one of the rare five-star athletes that's going to come out of the state of Utah, plays for Corner Canyon High School, uh, just ran a 10 300-meter dash in high school track here, one of the fastest times in Utah high school history. Uh, he is a 2025 prospect, recently committed to Ole Miss of all places. He's going to go play uh, for uh, the the Rebels. But he said that the the Utah, which was a lot of pe- in a lot of people's mind, Jerome Miles, Miles was like Utah's to lose. But he said this, Utah was off the table for him entirely. He said age was, he said, was arguably the most important aspect of the recruiting process for him, speaking of the situation of coaches and where they're going to be. It's a conversation that is going to be prevalent, I think, for however long this goes on with Kyle Winningham. And that it's not fair to Utah, but guess what? It wasn't fair when BYU had Lavelle Edwards getting in the twilight of his career. Remember, he's, I don't know if you know this, Chris, you may be a little too young for this. In 1999, uh, no, it was the year 2000, his final year of Lavelle Edwards' coaching career, he had signed a five year deal. It was the first time he'd ever signed a long term deal. Guess how many years of that contract he ultimately fulfilled? What was it, like one? One. One. And then retired. And he, so it's a give and take here. I do wonder how it's going to go, but as long as this continues to uh, kind of percolate out there, it's going to always be there for Utah. And that that's totally valid. Like, because, like I said, if I was a recruit, like, I would want stability and, and at least knowing what's going to happen. One interesting thing, is, mm-hmm. and I, I compare Whittingham to Nick Saban because they're a similar age, yes. right? Saban's about five years that, older, but yeah. That question was never around at Alabama, at least that I'm aware of. Like Saban, was, yeah, Saban was considered to be a lifer. 
Like, right. So we didn't have these high school kids questioning like, oh, I don't know if I want to go to Alabama. I don't know how long Nick Saban's going to be there. But Saban said towards the end that it started to come up because he was 72, I think, is when he ultimately called time on it. And good for uh, for uh, for Nick is he made an incredible run. There's no doubt about that. The, the problem is I think Kyle's own words have been kind of used against him here. He said, and if I'm still coaching at 65, I, 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 don't, I, don't think, I don't think I'll be there. So my question is, do you know when that quote is, like, is that something he said recently or was it like 10 years ago? It's been like in the last three to four years. So they, okay, but yeah. So trust me, there are people who know Kyle far better than I do that claim that the end is coming sooner than later. Right. What? But who knows? But, but no, but I doubt even Kyle, I I really doubt Kyle himself knows at this point either. There's no way he's going into the say this, this season, even if he's not telling anybody else. Like, yeah. he's not saying to himself, "Okay, this is my last year." Yeah, the, I, I don't think he's going to know until he knows. I, and I say I agree with you on that. And the thing, here's the thing: you say soon, soon is relative. Right. Soon could be three years or ten years, depending on what your perspective is of the situation. I, so. We'll see what happens, but an interesting piece all the same and uh, something absolutely worth uh, talking about. All right, coming up next, uh, we'll flip gears and we'll talk about the more, I guess, I like to call them dumb things in sports. we get the technical fouls. Coming up at 11 o'clock, uh, David James will join the program. Uh, so more to come. This is the Saturday show right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. If you're coming from the street with dirty shoes on your feet, that's a technical foul. If you switch the radio to some modern music show, that's a technical foul. If you touch the thermostat, you'll get hit with a bat. Cause that's a technical foul. You will feel my wrath. That's a technical foul. Personal file, 69, office. He was giving them the business. A technical foul. Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5 DKSL Sports on time now for technical fouls. All right, uh, Christian, did you know we speak mis- Midwestern here in Utah? Oh, yeah. No. Okay. I'm fluent. <laughs> so I just literally saw this pop up on Twitter. Uh, it's a, from an account called Midwest versus Everybody. It says, speak Midwestern 101. So I, I want your thought on I'm going to get your thought on this because I think we absolutely speak Midwestern based on this here in Utah. Uh, first thing, we'll see equals not coming. Completely agree. Hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, I'll let you know. I will not. Okay. Hmm. Not sure yet. Equals very sure about not coming to that thing. <laughs> yeah. It's like so. Basically, what I'm getting at is that we're we find polite ways to yes. say we're not doing to it. Say no. Say, say, yeah. say no. Yeah. No. Trust me. I'm, uh, next thing. I'll see if we can make it work. Equals it will not. It won't work. And then the final one, uh, quote, I'll think about it, equals nothing to think about and not going to happen. (laughs) So we we speak Midwestern, apparently. Oh, yeah. In the state of Utah. All right. That made me chuckle. All right. uh, So a couple things we got going on uh, in the sports world. Uh, The Scotty Scheffler situation continues to be the gift that keeps on giving here for technical fouls, Christian. Uh, They had a press conference earlier this week with the mayor getting up in front of people and Essentially, give him like a political rally, it felt like in a way, as he was discussing the findings of the early part of the uh, investigation into the Scotty Scheffler deal at Valhalla. Obviously, many of you might recall uh, two Fridays ago, he was put in handcuffs, hauled off to the precinct, and then uh, less than an hour later was back at Valhalla and shot a five under in the PGA Championship. Uh, I assume you saw this video that came out of that security camera that shows Scotty Scheffler nowhere near dragging anybody and also making a very measured and slow left turn and stopping. And then all of a sudden this big burly cop detective slamming on his window and then dragging him on hauling him out in cuffs. I'm like, okay, what, what are we seeing here that screams that we need to uphold a second degree felony assault charge on Scotty Scheffler? There's something out there. Cause they, they did not drop the charges in that press conference. The, the, it, we're so early on in the investigation. Based on that video, Scotty Scheffler's lawyers have got to be thinking, ah, we got this thing in the bag. And, of course, the officer didn't have his body cam on. Oh, right? and he, he, it's dis- he got, quote-unquote, disciplined for that. And as DJ said, is he going to get 20 push-ups? Like, what, what's the real di- – like, come on. The, no, the highlight of the video for me easily is, like you said, like you can see Scheffler's – vehicle just makes this routine left-hand turn it's yeah. not like he's driving like a maniac no. then all of a sudden out of the frame like the the cop runs up like just hauling, yeah and knocks on the window really hard and 
that that made me chuckle. Well, and the other thing about it is we've had Mean Wu Lee, a couple other PGA Tour players, who said that they did the exact same thing that Scotty did and did ha- have an issue getting in to the, to the course, which, I don't know. Like, drop the charges. Get out of your own way now, Louisville and Metropol- Metropolitan Police Department. Just drop the charges now and let it die. That's the biggest thing is they're making themselves look like fools the longer that this continues to drag on. He has his initial court appearance. It was delayed until June 3rd. It's a Tuesday. If it's not dropped by then, what are we really doing here? But nonetheless, technical foul once again on the LMPD. That's just a, it's a, it, Based on everything, the totality of the evidence I've seen from my own eyes, and I don't proclaim to be some legal expert at all, Christian, but everything I've seen screams that Scotty Scheffler's in the right here and LMPD has some explaining to do. Yeah, I uh... I I can't wait to see what ultimately comes something. from this. Yeah, something. What do you got for us this week? So speaking of legal battles, let's go with Shiloh Sanders. Okay, the the son of Dion, right? He's yeah. the he's a DB for Colorado. Is he got one year left now, or is he done? I, I know he was. To be honest, I'm not sure. Okay. On, on his. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, I, this story's interesting. Yeah. But anyway, so he was sued back in what does this say? Back in 2016. Uh, he was sued by a security guard for nearly $12 million in damages. I believe uh, the security guard broke his neck. Uh, it was some sort of assault that mm-hmm. happened. I don't know the story. But none of that money has been paid yet by ah. Shiloh Sanders. Okay. So now everybody's questioning his uh, – oh, and and recently Shiloh Sanders declared bank- bankruptcy. Oh, he's so, deco- so is he trying to essentially mitigate the actual payout here yes, with this? Okay. Yes, so that's what it sounds like. But, I mean, you've got this really high-profile student athlete. Of course, his dad is rich, has millions and millions and millions of and dollars. Let's, let's, not be, let's not mistake the fact that Shiloh has probably made quite a bit of money in NIL right, opportunities, Right, so that's too. what everybody's questioning. Like, where is all your NIL money if you're unable to pay even— Like, I don't think any of this money has been paid out yet. Got it, okay. And then now he is declaring bankruptcy, like Michael Scott, apparently. Um, I declare bankruptcy. Yeah. Yeah, so it's just this situation. I mean, it, tragic. I Like, I feel bad for the security guard. A broken neck. Like, sure, that's horrible yeah. to deal with. And then you sue. You win the lawsuit. And now you're, that's what, eight years ago and you still have yet to see a penny? Yeah, that's a pretty tough scene. So we'll see. I uh, I just read on this. Shiloh Sanders apparently underwent shoulder surgery this spring. Is out six months, it looks like. So he, there's a chance he misses the season upcoming. That would be interesting to see what happens there. But, yeah, that's that's a bit of a crazy story. I, I, I didn't even have that on my radar. I didn't remember him at that uh, that story coming up. But, nonetheless, uh, we'll see what happens. All right, uh, so there you go. That's technical fouls this week. Uh, there's other stories about uh, FIFA uh, and their situation with Saudi Arabia apparently going to host the 2034 World Cup. There's a lawyer out there saying that uh, the that FIFA must be willing to deny Saudi Arabia the rights to host the 2034 Men's World Cup if the kingdom fails to comply with human rights obligations, according to a le- new legal submission filed by the governing filed with the governing body. Here's the deal, folks. FIFA's as corrupt as anybody, and if, the, if Saudi Arabia wants to pony up the money, guess where this World Cup is going to be? The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It's just That's just how it's going to go. Yep. All right. That's the way it works. Yeah. Money talks, <laughs> and they have a lot of it. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll come back on the other side. David James joins the program next, and he and I will talk a little bit about what's going on with Real Salt Lake. I missed a really strong run, a 10-match unbeaten streak as they carry that into FC Dallas tonight. That's next right here on the Saturday Show. Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. All right, through the magic of radio, as you like to use this term, we're going to have a guy on that I work with on a regular basis. We're going to talk a little bit about what he and I have in common. David James, what's up? Monday through Friday mornings, not enough with you. Need a Saturday morning with you, too. <laughs> okay. I, need, I need six days of Jake. <laughs> That's a, Hey, I appreciate you six sitting down for a Six days a week. Hey, there you go. Nice. We talk sports. Now, now Steve, I'm in the PK role where I just randomly sing. And Steve Klauke just turned off the radio. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anyways, uh, he would turn it off because of the conversation we're going to have right now. Anyways. Oh, yeah. We're talking about his least favorite yes. sport. Well, I don't know if it's his least favorite sport. It's right up there. If not. It is, but I don't know how he feels about lacrosse, and I don't know if he's into MMA. You know, Steve? Texas, let us know. <laughs> Love to hear from you. Steve's 10 least favorite sports. Right. Go. 
Uh, but I wanted to talk to you for a minute just about RSL. Now, they're on a pretty phenomenal run right now. Ten- phenomenal. Yeah. Ten- Unbeaten in their last 10, ten seven matches. wins, three draws. And they've got an, a legit MVP candidate in Chicho Arango. Well, yes, but no. Well, oh, they're going to give it to Messi. Come on. <laughs> you know they're going to. Okay, you're right. We do have unless, a joke. Unless I would say if Messi has some kind of injury where he misses a you know, 10 or 15 portion. games, something significant. Well, he's also um, missing a game in Vancouver, allegedly, tonight, too. Not because of injury and not Just significant. He doesn't want to travel across the country, but hey. Well, the games are adding up, and I think that they didn't do Vancouver any favors. I'm getting derailed here. Yeah. But it's a three-game week, and then he's leaving for an international duty, and they're thinking, well, if you play all these games, you do all this travel, you're going to end up with a calf injury or a hamstring Correct. or something. There's be some muscle soft tissue injury. And it's like one game, it's not our home game, it's a six-hour flight one way, yeah. and you play on turf. No, that's the one. Yeah. So if the league was going to do Vancouver favors and actually have these guys show up and avoid this negative publicity, they would have scheduled it in a week where there was one game. Correct, yeah. Now, right. maybe they wouldn't have gone anyway. But he has played on turf. And he's actually said he's willing There's, to play on turf. That's the there, he, Didn't he play in Atlanta? He did. But you know, he, he's, he's one of the few who will play on who turf. Will play it. He's, he said, I grew up playing on turf. It yeah, doesn't bother cause me. Because like, guys like Ronaldo are like... Yeah, but he went through the Barcelona Academy, and they got a bunch of turf yeah. fields, and so he's playing on it forever. Okay, but anyways, besides the messy conversation, RSL on a phenomenal run right now. You want the politics of why RSL didn't get a messy home game? Uh, <laughs> or should we move on? Maybe at some point down the line we can okay, talk fine. about that. But uh, looking at what is going to happen here uh, coming up is RSL's got a back-to-back set here. They're at FC Dallas this mm-hmm. evening, and then they're at Seattle it's, on Wednesday night. It's 3-8. and eight. This last Wednesday is the only Wednesday sure. they have off in a month. Correct. They're playing nine times in 29 days. Days. And, and the only reason they didn't play there is because they blew that game into Mexico in the Open Cup. And they would have, yeah, they would have. Otherwise, they would have played every Wednesday and all month long. They would have been playing on a crappy turf field in, at St. John's University, is where the NYCFC2 plays. We had to find that out when we were doing that Open Dutch yeah. game. We had to look at avoid, the, avoid that flight. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But. Where do things stand right now with this club? Because Spenno, Lauren, and I—very good. I, who, who Very do the, good. <laughs> we, do the, we do the pre-match show, and we talk about this all the time. Like yeah. ten matches unbeaten, but Spenno, and I'll give him credit on this. He thinks this is still an incomplete team. He he wants them to use at least one, if not both, of those DP slots to add to this roster because he he thinks they can still get infinitely better. They are the attacking group is thin. It's productive. Mm-hmm. You got no complaints with the production, but it is thin. I mean, I do not want to speak aloud in front of Pablo because it turns out he's superstitious. I know, because I started to ask a question, and it was totally innocuous, by the way. He goes, don't jinx it, DJ. It's going too well. <laughs> I'm not jinxing it. And I asked a question. He was fine with it. I don't even remember what it was. Um, but uh, So that's a sign that things are going very well. And we had Jason Christ on Friday. Correct. And he said in 2009, similar vibe, not as good a spot in the standings, but it was going well. Yeah. And he didn't want to mess with it, and, and Garth wanted to add two players. And now I need to go back and look and see what two players they added because in the midst of time, I cannot remember. You and me both. I remember him saying that, and I was and like, like, which who two? Yeah, add? who did they add then, right? Yeah. Um, so he's in favor of adding more, and I think that um, they um, – I can actually see three players to add, okay. but they have two DP spots, and that's what everybody's talking about. I think they definitely need another attacker. If they have an injury, they get super thin. Yeah. Super thin, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't necessarily feel like they have to blow anyone out in the starting lineup among the four attackers. Um, I mean, Chicho is, like you said, it's an MVP caliber season. Sure. I mean, it's just it's astounding, but so is Messi, and Messi's Messi. So that's a problem. If yeah. two guys have an astounding seasons and one of them is named Messi, the other guy's going to finish second in the MVP Thanks voting. for coming, right. Chicho. But nonetheless, Chicho's off the charts. And even behind the scenes, Pablo's like, hey, I love the goals and I love the assists, but like you guys just don't see his leadership. And I think actually we do see some of it. We see when... Um, when he makes a run and doesn't get a pass and they don't score, and he's very good about that, by the way, and they don't score, I have seen him shoot daggers at Andres Gomez. Yeah. His eyes, daggers. Yeah. No words. He just he, he looks and he turns, he walks away, he doesn't say anything. The look, and then like Andres becomes very interested in the grass at that point. The eyes go straight down. He makes no contact. Man, look at this line. They really paint straight lines. I mean, yeah. he knows it because he knows. Yes. And at the same time, when they combine the celebration, mm-hmm. it really does feel like um, 
You know what it feels like is it's like Riley Jensen and his brother, and everybody knows Riley. Yeah, and yeah. I don't, but his brother is so much younger; he's almost a nephew, right? Yes. It's not. Yeah. I mean, I have a brother. I'm two years apart in school. We were on the same well, playground at the same elementary. Me school. and my brother were 19 months apart. Right, and they've got a big gap in age. I don't yeah. even know what it is. So he was kind of a mentor as his brother went through as a high school quarterback. And that's really that mentoring thing. That's what it looks like. Um, and, you know, Andres is coming on. Diego Luna is uh, is doing his thing. It's, it's clicking with yeah. him. And, you know, he's in a little different role, and he's adapted. Crooks doesn't have the stats, but every time I watch a goal, I think, well, why didn't he get the hockey assist there? And then I think, well, the only reason Gomez was open at the top of the 18 is Crooks made this diagonal run and dragged the whole back four down to the, the six. So... I know we all want the stats, and he doesn't have them. And he needs to get them. He does. Um, but at the same time, I'd be reluctant. They get, they've scored 27 goals. Yeah. He's doing something, right? Everybody's attacking is doing something. Yes. And the midfield and the defense is getting into it. You don't just score 27 goals because you got, you know, Harry Potter up top waving the magic wand, making stuff happen. Um, well, Chicho's gonna... Chicho does have a little bit of magic I was going to say, his ability well, to... <laughs> the, I thought, you know, they, they, they do the right things to earn a corner. Uh, the ball gets cleared. Meccanelli does what he's supposed to do. He holds it in. And that, if you slow that down, by the way, that looks like it hits the keeper's hand, hits the back of his head, hits the crossbar again, and then goes down to the ground. Actually, and Anelli hit the frame. He hit it twice, but it didn't go in. It's yeah. a game of inches. It didn't go in. Yeah. And then Chicho does. That is just magic, the way he, mm-hmm. the hops PK talked about with Jason Christ. The hops, and he gets up there and he finishes. So I don't know that they need to sit. And if you bring in a DDP, you're probably bring in a starter, but sure. you make them earn it, and they're not going to know the system, and they're going to be coming off a season if they're out of contract. Mm-hmm. So there'll be some acclimation period, and then you just see who's productive. And if you stay with the same four, I would just be reluctant to think that these guys are going to stay healthy all year long. Behind them, you've got uh, Anderson Julio, who when he plays big minutes gets hurt. So I, they, they should not play him big minutes. Correct. They've got uh, Fidel Barajas. Mm-hmm. Always a challenge not to say Fidel Castro when I open my mouth. I almost well, did it there. You hear Fidel. I'd be like, hey. and, then, and then you go to Chang, who's now in his early, trending towards his mid-30s, and he shouldn't be playing big minutes. So I think they need to add an attacker. I don't, I don't think there's any doubt. I think they need to add a center back. <clears throat> I thought with the two injuries they've had, um, you know, Holt's a fourth center back. I thought that's who Quinton is, that he's a fourth center back. Mm-hmm. He can play a little outside back. He's shown that. But I don't know if you want to make him a starter if they had an injury and put him out there in the biggest games against the best teams in the playoffs. That seems like a big ask. But the number of times I've heard people say, we want to win trophies, well, then plan for it. Mm -hmm. Okay? I don't know that anyone thinks that at 24, Philip Quinton, who was – kind of had a spot role. Yeah. It, I mean, he had a role, and, crew, and the crew are really good. They may be the team host hoisting the trophy in the fall. Who mm-hmm. knows, right? Um, so he had a role on a really good team, and they get him, which surprises me a little bit. And he's played well for him, but I just don't know that he's a guy who should be going 90 week after week with everything on the line. And if Varen Glad are healthy, he won't. Yeah. But mm-hmm. who's to say? So if they add a center back, because I don't think they really have a third center back, where they have a, a couple guys – who I know are fourth center backs because it's Tower Cap League. You only pay so much. Sure, yeah. you can only get so much of a. And rep you're relying at that point. on a lot of guys on lower contracts to fill big roles. Outside back. Okay, they're a little thin at outside back. They're okay. They've got their three player rotation. Sure, but if they wanted to add another back, Brody's playing big minutes, flipping back, flopping back and forth. Mm-hmm. Katranis is the guy on the left side. Hidalgo's been pretty good. He's hurt right now. But if they want to add a fourth outside back, I get that. Um, but that would probably be my third thing. So attacker one, mm-hmm. center midfielder two, outside back three. Okay, so the, 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 that's how I rank them in order of importance. And I think I would go right along with you on that, just in terms yeah. of looking at this. Now, with regards to the current circumstance for this squad, are they? I don't know. Honestly, living on borrowed time right now, like because they've had such a phenomenal run. Well, ten games unbeaten is unsustainable. Yeah, I mean, what they're supposed to go twenty unbeaten? Yeah. I mean, they're going to be losses. I think the streak's going to get ended in Dallas or Seattle. I don't okay. see why you would pre- predict any other way. The combination of back-to-back road games is difficult. Correct. Uh, three games in eight days again after all the mm-hmm. you know issues they've had. Dallas is playing a little better. Seattle's playing a little better. They don't look great in the standings, but I think if you look at the last month versus the previous month, the arrow's up. Maybe not enough. We can debate that. But the arrow's up. You're going to be on the road twice, and they're going to rotate lineups because they're going to, I think, 
they're absolutely going to run a strong lineup out against Austin a week from today. Sure, absolutely. Playing three yeah. games in eight days. Yeah. So you're going to play a non-first choice 11 here at some point. Probably midweek in Seattle would be I logical. I would guess so, yeah. Right? Um, and I also believe that in streaks, you do get fat and happy. You do walk around and people tell you how good you are. You look at the stand, you see how good you are. You see whatever power rankings or social media or, you know, your brother calls you or some, yeah. you know, childhood friend calls you. You guys are awesome, man. And, and you get all that and you lose the edge. And the edge between winning and losing is so fine in most sports and certainly in Major League Soccer. You don't have to lose much. And to me, there are games like this, that 5-3 win. You know, you'll see games where a baseball team's hot and they score three in the eighth and four in the ninth. They come back and win. These guys are unbelievable. They're so competitive. Yes. And coming back from a 7-1 deficit in the eighth and ninth inning also is not sustainable. Sure. Well, neither is a 5-3 win. So you start to see the, the nuts and bolts loosen up a little bit, and that's when things fall apart. Okay, so I want you, because most people know you, you're covering everything out there mm-hmm. in the world of sports. You're that's getting so- harder to do as we grow it, up here. It is. In the Big 12, that's a lot of football the big, to watch. The Big 12. That's a lot of basketball adding to watch. Adding NHL to the mix. And now we're adding the NHL to the yeah. mix. They're literally going to be playing at the same time. So I want you to make your pitch for the lay sports fan who may not have watched Real Salt Lake or soccer very much for them like to, to watch this. Because I think most people realize what you do, you cover it all. Yeah. And you do have you do what you do with, with RSL and soccer. You've talked often about how there's parallels between basketball and oh, soccer, yeah. and I've used yeah. I've, I've used your analogy with multiple people, and they're like, "That's absolutely brilliant." And it's it's true. The more you learn, and yeah. and Pablo having that conversation once, and he said George Carl. We got him on the air to yeah. tell us George he, Carl. He golfed with George yeah. Carl, and George Carl was drawing golf, basketball, soccer parallels. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So, give the like sixty second uh, spiel for why a. Uh, Joe Blow soccer fan here in the state of Utah should look at RSL and consider watching more. Joe Blow soccer fan or Joe Blow Joe, sports, Joe Blow fan? sports fan? So, well, first off, I would tell you that I really don't like the argument. I mean, you like what you like, mm-hmm. sure. and you play what you play. And so, first off, I would say stop trying to conform, especially as we get more of everything here as we grow up. Don't feel like you got to do what everybody else does. Embrace what you like. Embrace what you like. Yeah. And in my case, embrace what I played. And I played basketball. And I would have played anything because I might – Dad's kid, and I, at an early age, Dad turned on the TV, and whatever was on, he watched. In the era of wide world of sports, it was super random, three unreal, but he'd watch them, yeah. right? He would watch everything. And I don't, I actually don't get into as many sports as him, even though you say I get into everything. My dad's into auto racing. I just, I, okay. I, I don't get it. I, I know I'm all things to all people, but NASCAR, any car, Indy at our house, when it wasn't on TV, Dad and Grandpa would wash and wax my grandpa's Jaguar in the driveway. Okay. Hand wash and hand wax and listen to the race. Every year, set your watch by it. And I was <laughs> bored and would walk away. I just, okay. I don't know. It didn't click. Got it. It didn't click. I don't understand horse racing at all. I went with college friends one time, and I stood on the rail at Santa Anita. And when those horses thunder by... You can feel it, like Pablo says. You feel it in your soul. I've been to tr- I've been to Churchill Downs to watch oh, yeah. races, and you can feel it. You're just seeing the grand super stands. impressive. Yeah. Not my thing. Don't they're uh, powerful. I don't know animals, but yeah, yeah I'm with you. I yeah. don't know. So you like what you like. So first off, don't don't feel like you have to. But if you want to go and like, how am I going to get into this? Um, it is a lot of basketball. It's how do you create a three-on-two? How do you create a two-on-one? How do you get one person all by themselves with a chance to score? That's what everybody does in basketball. That's what everybody does in soccer. I think that's what I'm going to find out everybody does in hockey. I'll bet, even I've though watched, I'm not into it, I'll bet that's what everyone does in lacrosse. I've watched hockey enough in the, last, like the playoffs right. going on right now. I'm noticing, yes, you're essentially trying to create overloads, and you're trying to find a three-on-two or a two-on-one, mm-hmm. and guess what? You put that person in a pickle, and then you get it right. It's just... How precisely do yeah. you pass? Yeah. Jo- there's a story about John Stockton that he walked up to a new teammate. Uh, John, where do you like the ball? And the guy was like, hmm, what? He says, when you shoot, you catch a pass. Where do you want it? And the guy, the guy's like, I want it on the letters. And John said, okay, and walked away. <laughs> and the guy's like, that was weird. And then they went out, and the guy yeah. had his first practice session. And every pass Stockton gave him, nothing hit him in the hip. Mm. He didn't reach out. Nothing at the shoe tops. Everything hit him in the letters. Precision. Not in the yeah. face. Yeah. yeah. And so the precision in soccer, this whole thing about the U.S. will be good in soccer when their best athletes play, I do not believe. 
athletically, the U.S. already competes with the world. Yeah. When the U.S. wins, they usually out-athlete the other team. But the ability to make the ball do what you want, to the pass, to bend the pass around the defender, uh, to shape the ball, sure. or yeah. to deliver the perfectly weighted ball. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it can't come in too hot. Yeah. It can't come in too heavy, right? Right. It's got to be the perfectly weighted. That ability to pass and the buildup, um, you know, I, I've enjoyed watching that. PK was saying the other day when he was talking about hockey, and, and clearly he got defensive about that. That was awesome. Yes. Usually, he yeah. makes me defensive. Yeah. It's just awesome once yeah. in a while to it see how the other half lives. Yeah. Um, I like learning about, you know, new stuff and and figuring out the new stuff is intriguing. I get bored doing the same old thing over and over. I just, you know, when you get into a playoff series and you're like, mm, the Cavs aren't going to win this. Yeah. The Cavaliers aren't going to win this. I can't sit there and watch it. And I know I need to because I need to be able to talk about it. I just... You know, it's, it's brutal. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Well, I don't know if it's brutal. Oh, well, it's just you, you're, working construction jobs outdoors when okay, the weather that sucks. Is, That's brutal. I have a brother. But it's the downside of our job, yeah. and nobody wants to hear about the downside of our job. And I get that. But that's. The but way. if there is a downside, sometimes it's like sitting there watching something for two or three hours when you know a hundred percent how it's mm-hmm. going to turn out. Soccer does have randomness. You rarely know exactly how it's going to turn out. In that regard, even though baseball and soccer people loathe each other for reasons I don't fully understand, but there's a cultural thing there. Um, Baseball, you know, any one game, yeah. any one game, anybody can beat anybody. Tommy Lasorda, great line. You win 50, you lose 50. What, tell me what you do with the other 62. Because mm-hmm. everybody wins 50 and everybody loses 50. Yeah, that- I use that when I look at soccer standings, by the way, but I don't have time to tell you about it now because I think you have to go to break. We do have to hit a break. So thanks it's, for stopping by. No worries. Anytime. All right. Uh, so DJ will be on the call tonight. Tonight, 5 30 so, for the pregame show yeah, with you. Correct. And Spenno. Yes. Spenno, Lauren, and I will be and having Lauren the will pregame. Yeah, so Everybody's there. Last, last I heard, nice. all three of us will be here. And then, 5:30. You and, and then you and Jay will be on at 6 30 with the call of the match. So looking forward to it. But yeah, we'll do this again soon, okay? All right. All right. There you go. That's David James. More in a moment. This is the Saturday show right here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Jay Catch, Christian Esparza, breaking things down, and never a bad time to play some 311. So nice choice there, Christian. Super underrated band. And underrated, not- though? Come on. They were like the, they were it when I was in high school. See, so that's the thing. A little bit of a generational gap. Not sure. very many people my age know about them. Got I mean, it. Amber is like their most popular song, and that song is kind of almost memed uh, so to a point. Here's but. the thing. Amber is like not even the top ten of their songs in my right. book. But anyways, exactly, yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, I have a buddy who legitimately every March 11th, he goes and sees 311 play wherever they're at. Typically, they've played in their hometown of Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, Kyle, if you're listening, he's probably not. He, we're high school buddies, high school teammates. He is 311's like super super fan. That's awesome. So, anyways, good choice there. All right, time for five minutes of talking about some of the topics we have not had a chance to cover quite yet. All right, uh, so let's go to the NBA draft for a minute here, Christian. Bronny James, lightning rod, obviously in this draft. Uh, he is going to stay in the draft despite having very uh, lackluster st- statistics at the collegiate level in his lone season at USC. Albeit uh, the cardiac arrest episode. To over, have overcome that, that is impressive in and of itself, and he's been cleared. Uh, doctors have signed off on him resuming his playing career. But 30% of FanDuel's tickets uh, have been cast on him being taken first overall by the Atlanta Hawks. The presumed number one overall pick, Alex Saar, a, a prospect out of uh, Australia most recently, he's only getting 14%. Of these bets. Uh, it's even higher, by the way, from BetMGM, 36.8% of the bets. What are people doing here, Christian? Are they just throwing away money? Because it sure seems that way. I think, you know, I'm not a gambler. It's it's too hard to try to predict that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think in where this draft class is such a crapshoot anyways, maybe some people are saying, why not? Why not, Bronny James, <laughs> I guess? Because there is the whole thing where a couple years ago, LeBron James said, oh, yeah, whoever drafts my son, like, that's where I'm going to go play. I doubt that that really happens, but it's a possibility, right? So I think people are kind of just leaning into that 
uh, scenario. You know, if it happens, then it happens. I think anybody would want LeBron to play for them, even if it's for a sure. year or two. But I, I think he has tempered all that. Cause he talked so long about wanting to play. He's like, my final right. year in the NBA, we played with my son. That was like a few years ago, at well, least even, three years it's ago. It's longer than that, I think, at this point. Maybe right. seven, eight years old. And I think he's tempered all that. And by the way, Bronny's really kind of said, I- I'm excited to be in the NBA. But the way he has talked screams to me that he wants his dad nowhere near being on the same roster with him, in and my that's, opinion. I could talk forever about this poor kid. I mean, his parents went to the freaking combine. Like, <laughs> Wait, he's out of the playoffs. Come on, he had nothing else to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's like, I does LeBron just have no awareness as a father? Like, to me, I, okay, I don't have kids. You uh-huh. have kids. Like, this screams bad dad to me almost in a way like if you realize the amount of negativity that's being thrown at your son because of your actions like why would you keep feeding into that and that's that's my thoughts on this i would not classify lebron as a bad dad because lebron right okay that's a good point because he has been involved in his children's lives to an insane level especially considering he has spent more than half of his life as as one of the premier if not the premier basketball player in the world i'm glad you brought that up that's actually a really good point it's unfair to say that he's a bad dad because of this but to separate you can separate the two things here Yes, some of the stuff he's doing is heaping some, maybe some unrealistic expectation, pressure, whatever it is, on Bronny because Bronny to me and his agent, uh, Rich Paul, who is very close to LeBron, says, we're not interested in signing a two-way deal. There's no way that's happening. NBA teams know this. They're all leveraging. Like He's not going number one overall. If he goes number one overall, that screams to me this draft is about as bad as everybody believes it is, and it's worse, and it's a total play by Atlanta in the hopes that LeBron will say, I'm passing on the, is it 50-some-odd million dollars he could make from the Los Angeles Lakers, and I'm going to move to Atlanta and play with my son for the Hawks. I don't see that happening. Yeah, and so I think LeBron just needs to have awareness and be like, okay, there are times where it's, you know, you need to be LeBron James, the father to Brian. Sure. Yeah. And times where you need to be LeBron James, the the one of the best players in NBA history. And it seems like right now he doesn't have any awareness of when to separate the two. And he needs to. But it would be absolutely ridiculous to me if the Atlanta Hawks take Bronny James hoping that LeBron is going to go there. <laughs> Yeah, and then they end up getting burned. Like to me, you would need confirmation from LeBron. Yeah, and that's one thing that's interesting with the NBA is they do their free agency after the draft, as opposed to like the NFL, their free agency is before the draft. So yeah, if you do this, if you take Bronny with the whether it's one overall or thirty-two overall or wherever, if you take Bronny with the hopes of getting LeBron James without any confirm- confirmation. That's bad process, man. Oh, you, you yeah, that insane. Uh, it's just I, I look at this; I, it's crazy to me. And they are saying that most of these wagers are under a hundred bucks. So it's not going to create a liability for these sports books, but still, the fact that he is the most bet on number one uh, pick in the NBA draft. So that's a good kind of pointer to. It's not people actually saying, "Oh, I think." He's going to be taking first overall. They're taking flyers. Seems like it's more so like, a yeah, if it happens, it happens. I'll yeah. win a couple bucks. Yeah, I don't know. It's crazy to me. I, I just don't see any scenario where LeBron's leaving the Lakers. And very well could be the Lakers end up taking Bronny or they engineer something to get it. LeBron's got his hand in everything, it feels like, in the NBA. If he wants something to happen, it feels like more often than not it does happen. If he wants to have Bronny on his roster, who's, who am I to say that the Lakers won't make it happen? He is the LeBron father. Uh, LeBron father. Ah, hey, I like that. Well done. Well done. Uh, sticking on the basketball front, uh, Utah is going to be the home of the number one recruit in the 2025 recruiting class upcoming. So ostensibly, uh, Bronny obviously uh, takes some headlines, but Utah and the newly, uh, I guess, moved Utah Prep Academy, they're going to be moving in uh, to Hurricane out of out of Harriman. Uh, but A.J. DeBonsa, five-star wing, is going to play the 2024-2025 season at Utah Prep, which will begin operations based out of Southern Utah and Hurricane this upcoming academic year. Uh, Utah Prep previously was the RSL Basketball Academy in Harriman. Uh, it was then divested uh, by SEG because of stipulations with owning the Jazz. But Pretty cool to think that the number one recruit in the entire country is going to be playing hoops here in our state. No, that's absolutely 
It's so cool. And I was reading up a little bit on this kid. Mm-hmm. Gatorade Player of the Year in Massachusetts as a high school freshman. As a ninth grader. Incredible. That's, that's so cool. And so, yeah, for him to be playing in the state of Utah, that's awesome. I don't know how many of their games will be accessible to up here, us up here in northern Utah. They'll be more accessible now because of this. Right, and that's true. <laughs> I don't know what their circuit looks like. I'm assuming being in Hurricane, they're probably going to be playing in Vegas a lot. They'll be on that EYBL circuit, which is like kind of those top prep programs. He's coming from Prolific Prep. I think they're part of that circuit as well. You will go all over, all over the country. But, yes, they will be playing in Vegas often, I would imagine. So, it, you know, maybe if he makes the trip, I'm – probably shoot taking a shot in the dark maybe he'll have a couple games up here in salt lake city I, I don't know but that would be cool i mean it's the number one recruit in the country and most of the time those kids are from in you know california florida yeah. texas whatever so to have him here in utah as a senior like that's pretty cool yeah so uh he's 6 8 200 pounds average 21.2 points 9.4 rebounds and also three and a half assists for a prolific prep in napa california last year Kid can fill it up. He's got offers from literally everybody who's anybody in college basketball. Uh, University of Utah offered him earlier this week. I would imagine that I'm sure BYU will throw their hat in the ring. Uh, if you're wondering where Utah Prep is at, if you know the if you know what Diamond Ranch, Ranch Academy was, it was a, a, a school that pl- participated in the 1A ranks. They had a football program for a short time, uh, and they have essentially ceased operations. And that's where Utah Prep is going to move into into this uh, facility. There, uh, they have a really cool football. Field that actually uh, down between the hashes on their football field, it looks like a diamondback rattler, like a rattlesnake's a skin down the middle of the field. It's kind of an interesting look. That's cool. Now they don't have a football program yet. Could that happen? TBD. But uh, that's what they'll be moving there in Hurricane. So yeah, it'd be pretty cool to have uh, him pl- participating uh, here locally. And I do think the fact that uh, he could bring some extra attention to that program. Uh, you'll probably see a little bit more of Utah Prep Academy basketball than we might see otherwise. Oh, 100%. And like going back to his build, 6'8", 200 pounds, yeah. that's because he's a kid, right? Mm-hmm. He's maybe going to grow a little bit more. You're assuming he's going to put on muscle now that yeah. uh, he's going to get into his late teens and well, He's already 20s. 200 pounds already. Yeah. So. so that's like that's what these scouts and colleges fall in love with mm-hmm. is the build. Yeah. Because if he has that build right now, imagine what he's going to look like you know, in two or three years, or even like you look at Giannis and how much muscle he was able to put on after he was drafted into the NBA. Like, correct. That is the prototypical typical build that the NBA is pushing towards right now. These kind of long wing players. So he certainly fits that. And I mean, it, it, just looking at on paper, it, it's clear why he's the number one recruit in the country. Yeah, he and very well could be he could be the top overall pick of the 2026 NBA draft if all goes well because he screams to me the classic one and done guy like that just plays the one year and then ultimately goes into the NBA draft and we'll see what happens. All right, I want to talk some football as well before we wrap up here. Did you see the reports out of uh, Chicago earlier this week, Christian? Uh, Caleb Williams, obviously the top overall pick, uh, had a let's say a rough practice uh, in OTAs, uh, but his teammate came to his defense like very like uh, I think it was DJ Moore let's see uh, here we go DJ Moore said this the expectation was for growing pains is the quote he used uh, for Williams who the Bears drafted number one overall but he also said this it's frustrating but we also know what, that we're learning a new system unquote and they says he felt like the, he needed to relay that reality to Williams he said yeah you've got to you've got to because our defense can get pretty rowdy as you all know out there just calming everybody down in the huddle and just refocusing is the best thing unquote Okay, great. You know what? It's not great to have your number one overall pick, who you've already declared to be your starter, to, according to some reports, have a horrendous day on the practice field. Yeah, and it's, from my perspective, it's hard to take anything seriously from OTAs because they're running around in shorts. They are. And Jalen Johnson, though, is making life miserable for, for Caleb right. Williams. Yeah. The former So year. it's... It's hard to know what you're really getting. I mean, there were reports from Patrick Mahomes' OTA practices, <laughs> yeah. like he threw seven picks in one practice. So, yeah, you, you, it's hard to take this stuff seriously. I'm going to withhold judgment on Caleb Williams, you know, until he actually gets on the field in pads. But I certainly, like, for this to come out and be a headline, it, it puts that little worm in your brain like, oh, no. Is he going to be a bust? Well, and I'm sure Chicago Sports Radio was more than measured in their comments about this. Yeah, imagine if he was in Philly. 
That was a joke, by the way. <laughs> Chicago is notorious for ripping their players. And here's the thing. He's got a lot of pressure on him. A lot he, of pressure, a lot of expectations, and, and this comes with that. And he, he's invited part of it with the way he's operated in the past and everything. There were the reports early on in the NFL draft cycle that he might consider doing an Eli Manning deal and essentially forcing with the way we went. Then he was very quick, essentially, to get on the record himself saying, no, I'm happy to go to Chicago. It's like, okay, great. We'll see what happens. But, yeah, it's kind of like it's, it's, it's one of those scenarios you're like, all right, this is worth watching to see where it ultimately goes. Caleb Williams is an undeniable talent. He's got an incredible arm. He's got an incredible ability as a quarterback. I just look at him. Just, I'm just waiting to see, um, as you kind of mentioned, what happens as we move forward here. And that's the that's the interesting part of this whole situation is that, yes, they're working out in, in shorts and they're not wearing pads and everything. The season's not here yet. But as you mentioned, it kind of puts a little bit of a thing in your brain like, okay, is there a chance this could not work out? And obviously, those of us here in Utah, right, even if you're a Utah fan or not, like yeah. we watch them play Caleb Williams. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of people here who don't like him because of his divisive personality, you know. A certain statement the, the he put the on way his he, Yeah, the statement he put on Yeah. So there are a lot of people who are wanting him to fail. So, yeah, for this headline to get put out there, it definitely feeds into that. And me personally, like – yeah, I don't like his personality. I don't like a lot of the things that he did at USC. So I don't want to say that I'm hoping he fails because I don't want to wish that on anybody. But it's sure. like I don't want to root for him, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, he's such just an interesting character because he's he's an incredible like I say, he's an incredible talent, but he's just got this attitude that the attitude, yeah. yeah, it just rubs people down the wrong yeah. way, and uh, and it's hard to root for him. Yeah, I it's know. hard to sit here and say I want him to live up to all this hype when, you know, like you said, I'm gonna, you know, spare. But like this, this attitude that he had, this personality that he showed off at USC, yeah. like it rubs a lot of people the wrong way, and for good reason. All right. Uh, we will take a time out here. I want to talk about a topic, but I need more than a couple of minutes. We'll do it on the other side. Uh, there's a new era of the NCAA coming, and we'll talk about this. We'll wrap up this edition of the Saturday Show coming up next. It is 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone. Welcome back to the Saturday show here on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone, wrapping up another edition of the show. All right, so Christian, we have a new era of the NCAA about to begin. Uh, They have agreed to allow schools to directly pay their athletes for the first time in college football history, college, I guess, athletics history, uh, by virtue of settling uh, some antitrust case that are... uh, Essentially, what happened is the schools, the power conferences of which BYU and Utah are now members of, are have agreed to pay into a two point seven eight billion dollar fund uh, that is going to settle these cases and pay athletes that played between twenty sixteen and twenty twenty for their inability to get NIL deals. It's based off of a case called House versus NCAA, uh, but the way that things have uh, kind of come to fruition is the NCAA realizes if they were to take this case to trial, uh, they were looking at that damages nine into the double digits billions of dollars, which would have absolutely uh, bankrupted them and could have caused a whole litany of issues with college athletics if that if, if the NCAA were to have gone under. But as a result of this settlement, they have also agreed to some forward-facing uh, uh, changes in the NCAA. Beginning next year in 2025, each school will be able to share up to t- roughly t- between 20 and 22 million annually in revenue sharing with their athletes. Now, it is subject to Title IX, so how much of that is it have to be split 50 50 between men's and women's sports? Where does that money all get uh, filtered out to? That remains a question. But did you ever think we were going to come to this day where athletes are getting paid by their schools? Certainly, once the NIL stuff started in the more recent years, yeah. I think it was always trending towards. Um, revenue sharing revenue and, sharing yeah. and th- that this would eventually happen my question is and this isn't something that i've seen talked a lot about is what happens to all the collectives that have been made like 
are, are they still going to be doing their thing, getting so, even more money for these student athletes, or is all of the, I guess, payouts for these student athletes going to be f- directly from the universities? There are administrators out there who are hoping that this would kill off NIL and collectives and the like. It's there's no legislation on on the current. Um, the settlement, whatever you want to call it, the plan that they have to settle these cases, there's nothing on those books that say that they are going to get rid of collectives. So essentially what is going to happen here, Christian, is each school is going to be able to share up to 20 or $22 million annually. Now, that's the cap. The individual schools can determine how much money they're willing to revenue share. That That is up to them. The cap you can spend is 20 to $22 million. You can guarantee as many programs as possible, including the Cougars and the Utes, will be trying to get to that number where they can share the most because it's a recruiting advantage. But collectives are, are still probably going to be a thing. So now essentially the school has $22 million it has to work with. And then on top of that, now you have more NIL opportunities coming via those collectives, which obviously uh, can help uh, programs continue to be on top, like in Ohio State or so in Texas. basically the collectives are still going to continue to be these privately owned things. As far so as I'm this aware. this is just added on to whatever money these kids could already be making from the collectives. Okay. Bingo. Yeah. So this is it's an extra pot of money to be shared with these athletes, but twenty and twenty between twenty and twenty two million. That is far more than most of these collectives, most single collectives have been footing the bill for. Uh, I know there's the whole story about Jaden Rashada suing Florida for that NIL deal that he claims is a fraud. It was supposed to be $13.85 million over his four years or whatever at Florida. Never saw apparently allegedly a dime of it. Now that is will be pending in court, that lawsuit from him. But most collectives aren't footing the bill for this much. So essentially... You've created a whole nother pot of money for student athletes, and it, it's going to change how things operate here because the whole farce of amateurism that has existed for years, like they're amateur athletes. They're, they're playing for more than just – come on, everybody. It's out in the open now. What was once uh, under the table, seedy stuff, they had an FBI investigation into it that really never came to anything, FBI or legally. Uh, now it's all on the open market. And now schools, it's a professional sports fran- franchise now. And that I am interested to see how many schools, A, first off, can foot the bill for another 20 to $22 million in their budgets because a lot of these are already strapped for cash. They're already running in the red, speaking of ha- running a deficit on an annual basis. And, oh, by the way, now you have to add 20 to $22 million. And there's another part of this I should mention real quick before we wrap up is that they're also adding a sense where they're no longer going to get rid of scholarship caps. So like uh, baseball, for example, if you have a baseball program, Southern Utah has a baseball team, or they did at one point. They used to. They got rid of it right before I started So, So there. baseball, you have like 30-some-odd players on that roster. They are capped with 11.2 scholarships currently under NCAA rules. They're going to get rid because of Because of Title IX and everything. Yeah. They're going to get rid of the scholarship stuff, and since they're going to have roster limits. So you're going to be able to say, okay, we have uh, – I'm going to use baseball as an example here. There could be a 35-man roster. That's what the NCAA is going to say. You can have 35 players for your baseball team. However many of those you want to have full scholarships for, that's up to you. Really? So you can Okay, ha- that's so, interesting. But here's the deal. If you want to fully fund scholarships, that's running you in the millions of dollars as well. I've heard estimates of between 10 and $20 million of its own to fully fund scholarships for single programs that you may want to fully fund scholarships for. Right. It's a lot of money. Wow. No, and this is ridiculous. And this is, I mean, you look at like all the money that these, I guess, leagues, Mm -hmm. these conferences have been bringing in because of the TV deals recently and all that. Like it's been, the money's been going up every single year, every single year. So they're, they're getting more and more money to play with, but it is an interesting conversation because like you mentioned, we talked about this on Jake and Ben yesterday. Like a lot of people don't realize that these Schools actually barely make any money from athletics. There are only a few programs out there that make actual revenue, and, that's, and even then, is it's not a very significant number. No, they're not absolutely rolling in it. Like the Texases, the Ohio States, the Bamas, the Georgias. Yeah, they're making money. They're they're in the black. Most programs at the power level and most programs across FBS are running at a deficit. They're relying on student fees and a number of other things to fund what they're doing. Uh, the the crazy thing is, is you look at, okay, you're going to have tens of millions of dollars you have to come up with in budget. 
where are cuts going to come from or where are these boosters who are already being asked to fund NIL stuff? Are they going to pull money from those NIL collectives to go into this pot for this revenue sharing? I don't know what the answer is going to be. I am interested to see how it goes. I'll just say this on the local front. Uh, Utah, if you read their reports, they brought in a modest uh, return. They got, I think, like they made like $2 million roughly. They, I think it was like $124 million spent, $126 million generated. BYU, uh, they were in the high 90 millions range, if you believe the uh, equity and athletic department um, reports. BYU is a pu- private university, doesn't have to put the public statements out there, whereas the University of Utah does. BYU's whole thing is they always they, they have a mandate from the school itself. They have to run in the black. They cannot run a deficit. The school will not cover for them. I'm interested to see how these two programs, who have typically, speaking of the Utes and Cougars, been very fiscally responsible, how they absorb this. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, we've been saying, like, this is the wild, wild west, and it basically just got a whole lot more wild yeah, because it, of this. And there's a lot of unknowns that we're going to get answers to Maybe not immediately, but within the next year or two. And by the way, this is not like years down the line. This begins next fall, everybody. Fiscal year 2025, 2026. So beginning, so the fiscal year typically is July 1. So July 1, 2025, there's the money. Start sharing it. And that, there's going to be a lot of interesting meetings going on with athletic departments in coming days and weeks saying, okay, uh, we need to carve out an extra $20 million in the budget. And they're, they're, people are looking at them like, uh, Okay. Yeah, by next year. <laughs> so you have 13 months to figure, to it figure out, out yeah. how to get 20 million more dollars. Yeah, and that's that and that's just for the revenue sharing aspect. If you want to fully fund scholarships for whatever other the women's tennis team over here or the soccer team there, that's money as well that you got to come. It's just good luck. And it's just I I don't see where ready-made answers are going to come, but there's going to be some Interesting meetings with some financial folks in coming days. Glad and that weeks. we get to sit here and talk about yeah. it instead of being in those meetings. Being like, hey, so solution. sorry about that upgrade you wanted for your facility. It's not happening. It's just I, whew, crazy. It's the wild, wild west is exactly what it is. All right. Any final thoughts from you, Christian, before we wrap it up here? No. Great Saturday show. Great, great way to start the day. Uh, I'll see you later for RSL. Yeah, right? we're, we're both going to be back uh, in just a little bit. Uh, we got RSL coverage beginning at 5 30 at the RSL pre match show. 6 30 first kick uh, down there in Frisco, Texas, is FC Dallas and RSL uh, square off. RSL looking to extend that 10 match unbeaten streak. Also, later tonight, you'll hear the Utah Royals as well. They'll be on 1280 AM the zone. And pending weather, the Salt Lake Bees will be streaming on the KSL Sports app. So, full night of sports. Uh, stay tuned right here on the KSL Sports Zone throughout today and also throughout the upcoming week. We'll be back next Saturday right here on the Saturday show on 97.5, the KSL Sports Zone.